recently we had an event with Mark Roberge um, from HubSpot and his three top reps pre-IPO. Um, it was a, a fantastic event, well attended, um, and we had such um, we had such a large amount of requests to see if it was videotaped. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, but I have a fantastic team here who are all at the event, and I thought that it would be a really great idea to do sort of a video blog and talk about the main things that we thought were really important that we could take away and share with you today. So with that, um, I will hand it over to Carol Mahoney and she can introduce herself. Hi, so Carol Mahoney, I'm the founder of Unbound Growth. We're a scientific sales development firm. And I am a little bit biased because I know some of the people that Meg is talking about, I know Mark. My favorite takeaway from the night was actually towards the end when Mark was talking about how they became such a customer focused model that actually customer success became more important than the revenue. And it was actually interesting to hear how he did the analysis where they used to think that their top salespeople were the ones that brought in the most deals. But when you're a SaaS based technology company, churn is a major issue. So if you're losing customers half as fast as you're gaining them, over a period of time, you're not actually making profit, you're not actually growing and scaling, and so this was a major issue. And his initial thought was that there must be something going on in the handoff between sales and service, and what he actually found is, is that some of their very top sales reps were actually some of the ones who had the highest churn. And what was interesting is, is how he changed the metrics of how they were measured, not by just number of sales that came in, but by how many of those actually stayed after a year. And when you change how they're measured, you change how they're motivated, and it changed how they sold. So even those who were having higher churn rates, once that changed, and of course, HubSpot's great about having the resources to get them to make that switch to not just selling more, but selling better. And it made the whole dynamic of the sales culture focused on customer success, which I think is awesome because that's where it should all start. And that's fantastic. I second that. <laughs> um, and from there, you know, and we were talking about, um, you know, we, I thought uh, something that Mark and Mary and, and Dave and Adam all talked about um, was, you know, development, right, and, and leadership. So um, Mary Rogel had told me a story that, you know, of all the places that she's been, HubSpot really provided that kind of um, that nurturing development um, to her success, right? So she had never sold software as a service before, um, but she could sell. And they saw that intangible in her. Um, and, you know, Mark made a, a conscious decision to say, we're going to invest heavily into developing our people and coaching our people, right? So. And, and Mike, you can speak to this uh, certainly as a you know sales manager for years, a VP of sales, a CRO. Um, you know that I think in in all aspects that if you had one main thing you could do all the time, it would be to coach your people, right? But it gets reactive, and you got to get sales, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. Um, but you know, Mark or Bears really made it a, a conscious effort to to say, we're gonna give you tools to make you the best rep that we can and the most successful that you can be at HubSpot. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and going to that, and, and Mike, you know, certainly toss it over to you having that experience as well. Sure. So um, it's Mike Mollefelder. I'm uh, a sales executive based here in Boston. And as Meg mentioned, I've worked for uh, several companies, large, medium and small, high growth companies, startups, et cetera. And what's happened and um, what I really latched onto in the conversation is the, uh, the combination of a culture of accountability and respectability uh, in terms of uh, how you treat people. So all too often what we see are companies uh, where there's a belief that if somebody isn't making their number, especially if it's a, uh, a company that's an employee at will state, I can just fire them. And unfortunately that breeds a, a culture, especially in the sales organization of, uh, of mistrust of leadership, 
and apathy, right? Because I'm not going to put a lot of care and in, in, in concern into a job if I can just get fired tomorrow. Uh, and they talked about, uh, and I think it was Mark who really talked about it, um, you know, you don't fire somebody for no reason. You put them on a plan um, and you coach them. And sometimes people can be coached um, either to performance or back to performance because even great salespeople can forget some of the basics and they need to be nudged back onto their path. Other times uh, it, it is inevitable and people either can't perform in your culture or a decision is made. And I think they talked about even uh, when they put somebody on a performance plan and, and by the way, I operate the same way, you give them a decision. Uh, you can opt to work through the plan and see if you can work to success or you can just leave now and we'll pay you to go look for another job. Mm -hmm. uh, but that breeds um, a lot more respect, both one-on-one -on -one between the, the, that rep mm -hmm. and their manager, uh, but also from a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Because generally, if somebody's going to leave for performance reasons, the people in their group, in their cohort, um, know that there's a performance issue. It, mm -hmm. There's no reason to hide it. Um, but if there are other reasons why somebody should be, uh, should be part of the company uh, and they're taken out for one one value that being performance is an example. Uh, it, it, there's a, a negative cascading effect, and sometimes, by the way, performance isn't your quota. There are other there are other pieces that go into it. So we talked about things like churn. Um, more SaaS companies that I'm aware of um, are making churn part of the awareness for the rep. So it's not just what you sell, but does that customer stay? Um, we in my last company we taught uh, reps a, a little bit about customer acquisition cost or CAC, uh, lifetime value of customer or LTV, so that they could understand, even though we, candidly, we, we didn't do a good job of changing the comp plan, but we at least educated our sellers that it wasn't just about making the number, that we needed those customers to stay in the state for years. So can I just add on to what Mike said too, because I think yeah. one of the things that I don't know that a lot of people know about HubSpot is when at any point in, a, in the, I think you, after you've been with them for a couple of months or gone through basic training, they actually have a, what they call a tuition reimbursement program. So they have all of these great resources internally, but then they also have, so we actually have worked with some reps that uh, were put on plan. And because they had this tuition reimbursement program, they had the ability to go out and hire their own personal coach for a really intensive program. And, you know, and we saw them go from being on plan to being promoted and now going to president's club in less than six months. So they make that investment, even though you're on plan to be willing to let that rep to improve. And I think that speaks to what Mike, what you were saying about that culture of responsibility and accountability. And they actually give them the resources to take on their own development and take ownership of that, which I think is incredible. And I think if more companies did that, they would, and like HubSpot has seen, they see a lot of their top reps stay longer than a lot of companies do. I think that more companies that do the same thing, it's not just about making the middle or the bottom perform better, but how do we also keep the top performers here longer? How do we continue to challenge them when they're at the top of their game, if they're coaching? Yes, Carol, and speaking of culture of responsibility, there was also another point that was mentioned by uh, Mark Roberge and um, by David Donlan, which was about the accountability of the sales managers. So just as Mike just mentioned, it's very important to have the um, um, trustworthy culture, the respectful culture, where the sales performer uh, would know that their uh, time and uh, consideration is valuable. But it's also important to make sure that this is a dual process. And both uh, Mark Roberge and actually, you know, a lot of the uh, people in the room agree with that, um, that if there is a consistent procedure which would keep the sales managers accountable, and in HubSpot, they seem to have developed a metrics for that, um, where the sales manager is aware of each of their team members' strengths and weaknesses, uh, reports to their executive director on a regular basis about their progress and works with each of their team members to improve um, and um, expand their skills in terms of sales and commitment that helps the entire organization. David's made a point that said, don't be afraid to demand coaching from your leadership team. And 
I think even when you're in an interview process, and I mean, so I mean, I'm a full-time recruiter for multiple tech SaaS companies, and and so always talking to CEOs and, and VPs and thought leaders. You know, when you're even in the interview process and and talking about okay, so what does onboarding look like, and and you know can we talk about what a career path here looks like, right? Um, you know, demanding that, hey, like, I want to be better. I want to be able to improve and, and have those tools to do so. So, you know, demanding that from the company that you're working for only breeds a better culture, a, a culture that wants to succeed, not only, you know, singularly, but, as an entire team um and the sales contest i remember that too mark mark was and uh and uh, adam were very big about the sales contest because i believe adam won the uh the top prize right and it was uh it was like ten thousand dollars and a limo to mohegan sun for the night so you know uh, not all companies can afford to do such extravagant things but uh certainly uh, that was, you know, the power of sales contests to, to move your team. Well, see, I don't remember it as 10,000. I thought it was more like 1,500, but, you know, we can add a few oh, more. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to check that out because that's yeah. a big difference, but. <laughs> I want to fact check that one. <laughs> Speaking of Adam, he, he also mentioned about um, the role play in terms of measuring coachability during the interviews, and I thought this was really important to um, allow your prospective team member to get into different shoes and show you how much understanding they can do, um, uh, they can show and, and they can provide if they were a customer, as well as if they were the salesperson um, in the room. Yeah, and actually that you just remind me of something else, Nadia, too, which one is one of the things was looking at when you're going into the hiring process, looking for those that are coachable and motivated. I was just about to say the same, yeah. Yeah, and so going through and finding out, you know, what is it that they're personally passionate about? When was the last time they set a goal for themselves and how did they reach it? Or, you know, how are they continuously trying to up their game? What books have they read lately? There's a lot of questions that you can ask in the interview process to determine coachability, um, how they're motivated, or even how much they might be motivated. And I think that a lot of times companies kind of skip over that part or they don't, they, maybe they, they don't know how to ask or what to ask, but there's tools to help them to do so. So... Um, and I know we have a few minutes left. Do I have a chance to plug Mark's book for him? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, I did. I did want to just um, throw one thing on top of that because I wanted to throw it um, over to Mike because um, I thought Mike could really piggyback on what you just said because you know, hot, being a hiring manager for s not so long, Mike, but. <laughs> A seasoned veteran because you've been so successful from such a young age. Oh, we're back to the gray hair thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, as far as looking for that coachability, and we've had this discussion before about sure. having real conversations. Like, how about how, instead of you know, what are your strengths and your weaknesses? Like, how about what are your goals? Like, do you have kids? Do you have tuition to pay? Like, what you want to go on a trip? Like just real conversations and so how would you you know measure and, and see about coachability when you're hiring for, for your work? so there, there are a lot there are a lot of questions that you can ask but they uh, and a lot of it is style issues right but um if you weave the questions in a conversation you get a pretty good feel for somebody mm -hmm. and you can ask questions like one that i just saw um the other day was um Tell me about something that that you believed was impossible that you were able to accomplish, and then how did you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, you, I, I ask people about uh, working in a team environment. You know, walk me through an example of where you had to pull together a group uh, internally or externally, uh, and to win a deal. And how did that how, how did that work? What did that look like? Uh, give me an example of a deal where you were losing, uh, and you went and got help and we're able to win the deal. So there, um, or, or just flat out, who were who some of your mentors? Tell me what you've learned from those mentors. Who do you go to for help when you need help? And by the way, that doesn't matter if I'm, uh, if I'm hiring somebody or interviewing at a, a BDR level or a VP level. 
because if you ever get to a point in your career, whether you're two months in, two years, or 25 years in which you decide, I don't need to be coached anymore, I don't need mentors, uh, <laughs> we're, we're likely to have, uh, at least myself personally, we're likely to have a problem. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it says a lot about a person when they get to a point, uh, if they get to a point where they think they, they no longer need help. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. All right, so now, Carol, yeah, let's definitely plug Mark's Plug for Mark. Uh, so, it, and this is another one of the cool things that I love about Mark. So, uh, awesome book. I've heard of a lot of organizations that have made this their Bible. And all of the profits and proceeds go to an organization, build.org, that helps inner schools, um, schools that have not, be not as many resources, develop some entrepreneurs there. So, it's, it's an awesome book, and it, it's a good cause. Yeah, the program's amazing to be able to um, introduce these kids to entrepreneurship and mentor them. Um, and then, you know, the the graduation rate is has just, they've really seen it soar in comparison to what it would normally be. So, and that's um, awesome. yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Mike, so much you um, for being on this. And, um, you know, I think... It's great to be able to continue the conversation. Um, and if you have any questions, um, definitely reach out to us. We're, we're all on LinkedIn. And and find us find us on the Boston Enterprise Sales Forum meetup. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Keep it updated. A couple of events coming up. You're all welcome. Yes. We're Thank having, uh, yeah, we're, um, just and and that's just a little plug for ourselves. But the next two events, the next event in Boston is December seventh, um, and it is a, it's at WeWork on Mass Ave, and it's about diversity and inclusion and creating um, how you diversify your workforce and how you create a more inclusive culture. So uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing everybody there.